We're going to continue this morning by welcoming Rusty here in a moment to come speak. And uh, many of you uh, have heard him already in the beginning hour, and he's going to continue. We're going to give him as much time as possible because he does such a great job, and uh, it is very intriguing stuff. So uh, he purposely wanted me to keep his intro short um, because he wants to make the main thing the main thing and speak to you about biblical creation and what God has to say to us today. So let's give him a good, hearty welcome and a round of applause as he comes to speak to us this morning. It is such an honor to be with you this morning, and uh, I appreciate Pastor Dave and Janice and all those, Diane, all those that had a part in this, and I, I pray for your, you to be blessed by the Lord for having CMI, and this is not about me, it's about the Lord and about His Word. I will tell you a little bit about my wife and myself. We were missionaries in eastern Canada for almost 20 years working among the Mi'kmaq Indians as well as Caucasian people. And that's how we got so connected with creation ministries. We found out that people have a lot of questions about evolution. And a lot of times we need to answer their questions and then redirect the, the uh, conversation back to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that what, which really matters. And so, you know, people do, do need to know that God's word is trustworthy. And so CMI was a great blessing to us, and that's how when I came back to the States, I connected with CMI, and we're honored to be representatives of Creation Ministries International with offices in seven countries, and our U.S. office just happens to be just west of Atlanta and a place called Powder Springs. And so if you're ever in the area, stop in. There's a bookstore there that you can visit and maybe even talk to the staff, maybe even talk to one of our scientists while you're there. We would be honored to have you. But we specialize in answering hard questions like, how do you fit dinosaurs into biblical history? That's what we talked about in Sunday school. Did Cain actually marry his sister? Where did all the water come from for the flood? Where did all the water go? We're going to look at some of that this morning. But, and what about this one? If God is a God of love, why is there so much death and suffering in this world? We get that all the time. If you're sharing Christ with others, and you should be, if you know the Lord, then you're going to get that question. One of the best places to get answers to these kind of questions is our website. We have over 10, right at 10,000 articles from 35 years of creation research. All of it's free. All kinds of video clips, all kinds of information that will be a blessing to you. Now, if you know the answer to this, don't, don't, don't spill it. But we have one problem with our website. We have a very difficult web address to remember. So I'm going to ask you this morning to put on your thinking caps and get ready to memorize because I can tell you there's so much information here that will be a blessing to you. You're going to want to remember the web address so you can go to this website. Are you ready? You got your thinking caps on? There it is. Creation.com. Even I can remember that. Now, another way to get connected, to be a part of our team, is called Infobytes. This is a free email newsletter. Many of you remember Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter? You know, he was more famous here in America than he was in his native country of Australia. But when Steve was killed by a stingray in 2006, people wrote into our ministry with this question. If God is a God of love, why did he, did he design stingrays to kill people? Well, that's a valid question, really, for those outside of Christ. How would you answer that question? Well, one of our scientists, Dr. David Catchpool, wrote this article. And that article on our website rocketed to the top of our most read list in just 10 days. That's an example of what you would get through Infobytes. We don't spam you. We don't share your information with anyone else. And all you need to do to sign up, my wife is going to pass out in just a moment some sign-up sheets. You don't even have to put all this information. But if you put your name, your zip code, and your email address, got to have the email address, you will be signed up for Infobytes, and you'll begin to receive these articles. It actually links you to articles on our website. I hope you'll do that. Become a part of the team getting this information to equip you to be more effective if you go out and share Christ with others. Now, while you're doing that, we're going to move ahead. Speaking about dinosaurs, fossils, and the Great Flood, 
And I will begin, and just as I pointed out in Sunday school, mentioning that we at CMI believe that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of the living God. All of our scientists, all of our staff internationally stand on the authority of the word of God. But sadly, not everybody today believes the Bible is literal truth. Here we have two trees, two trees, two castles. I use another illustration, and I get them mixed up sometimes. Two castles that represent two vastly opposing worldviews. Just like the glasses in Sunday school. These two castles represent those two worldviews. Notice the castle of humanism, of evolution. Notice the balloons there. What comes about from that castle? What naturally stems up from that castle? Racism, homosexual behavior, abortion, family breakup, pornography, and the list goes on and on. Now, as concerned as we are about those things in our culture today, can I suggest they're not the primary problem? What's the primary problem? The prob problem is the wrong foundation from which all of this stems. This evolutionary foundation in which man decides truth for himself. But notice the castle of Christianity. Quite a distinction. The foundation of this castle is that God's word is truth, right? But notice the Christians here. We have people that, they don't know what they're doing. They're just shooting their cannons into the air. We have other Christians that are attacking these issues, but they're not attacking the wrong foundation. We have Christians that are actually attacking our own foundation by accepting theistic evolution, and in some cases even trying to put millions of years in the book of Genesis, trying to force it into the book of Genesis. You know, the Bible says if our foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? 19th century novelist wrote this, Elizabeth Charles. If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point with which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ, Wherever the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. Folks, for years, for centuries now, the attack has come on the book of Genesis. And I want you to notice the book of Genesis is foundational. If we can't trust Genesis, how can we trust the rest of what Scripture teaches our beliefs concerning marriage, our need for clothing, the seven-day week, the doctrine of sin and death, and even the gospel has its foundation in the book of Genesis. If you take away Genesis, if you say you cannot trust Genesis as literal truth, then all these other truths begin to falter. They begin to crumble as well. Frank Zindler, an American atheist, when debating William Craig, said this, if there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. If there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a Savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. Folks, if there never was a real, literal Adam and Eve with a sin that resulted in death, Frank Zidler is exactly right. So yes, the gospel does have its origins, its foundation in the book of Genesis. And I am concerned that through the years, the church as a whole has failed to defend the historicity of the book of Genesis. And that's exactly where the devil is fighting. And because of that today, I think... That's one of the primary reasons we're seeing our young people grow up and walk away from the church. You know, according to uh, pollster George Barna, 70% of Christian children brought up in Christian homes and in the church will walk away from their faith after they leave home. We get statistics back anywhere from 60 to 88%. Southern Baptist Council on Family Life, 2002, 88% of our children are walking away and never returning. But would you be satisfied to know that 60% even was walking away from the church and never returning? I wouldn't be. Man, what a responsibility God has given us 
to defend that foundation. You see, we've been proclaiming the gospel. We've forgotten about the foundation, the foundation for the gospel itself. It's also had an effect on morality in our country, too. Many of you might remember Jeffrey Dahmer. He brutally murdered 17 boys. November 29, 1904, he gave this Dateline NBC interview in which he said this, if a person doesn't think that there's a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we died, you know, that was it. There is nothing. I've since come to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is truly God. And I believe that I, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to Him. His worldview changed. But do you see the moral implications of that humanistic evolutionary worldview when taken to the, we could say, the extreme? Richard Dawkins, this is an evolutionist that understands the logical consequences of his evolutionary worldview and admits it. One of the most outspoken critics of the Christian faith today said this on ABC Radio. I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to science, when it comes to explaining the world. But I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to morality and politics. He wants his worldview, that humanistic evolutionary worldview, but he doesn't he doesn't like the fruit, the consequences of his own worldview. He wants the morality of the Christian worldview. And he admits it. You see, what I believe affects how I live. If I believe that God created Adam and I'm a descendant of Adam's, then God sets the rules. It's to him that I will give an account. Like Dahmer said. But if I believe I emerged from Ponscom, and evolved through ape-like ancestors, then man sets the rules. Hey, if it feels good doing, it doesn't matter. So what we believe does affect how we live. I believe this is the solution. We need to turn our cannons, not attacking the evolutionist. You know, most of our scientists, I think all of our scientists were evolutionists at one point before they came to Christ. We need to attack the false teaching. We need to give answers. We need to destroy arguments and show people that God's word is trustworthy. Man, we need to do that with our kids. Our kids are walking away from the church and everybody seems to think, that's not my child, that's not going to happen to me. People come up to us at almost every meeting and say, you were talking about my child or my grandchild. They've walked away from the faith responsibility God has given us. Don't just depend on the church. Folks, that responsibility begins at home. What a privilege it is to teach our children the things of the Lord. To bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. That's what Paul has commanded us to do. That involves destroying arguments. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. You see, we need to defend, yes, the historicity of the book of Genesis, showing that it is trustworthy to our kids, demonstrating that it's trustworthy to those that we witness to. People today are going to have questions. It's natural raised in the education system that people are raised in today with the media that they're raised with today. And folks, one of the best places to get equipped is the magazine. It's what God used in our life. We learned all kinds of principles from this magazine that was a tremendous blessing as we taught our children growing up and as we witnessed the people. And by the way, I just found out before I walked in here, I have a new grandchild. We've got a text this morning at 7 o'clock that my daughter, it's a girl we took in from Zambia, had gone into labor, and she's already had, it was a home delivery, she's already had that child. Isn't that cool? But we learned all kinds of principles that helped us with our daughters. Those principles are being used now with our grandkids. Like, for example, 
the distinction between operational and historical science. Most people, when they think about science, they're thinking about operational science. It's the science that gives us computers, data projectors, satellites, medical discoveries. It's the science to put a man on the moon back in 1969. But when you're talking about the past, whether you're talking about evolution or even creation, you're really talking about what's called historical science. Historical science cannot be tested in the same way. You cannot test the past. You can only test what is left behind. But you are not observed there to observe how it became like it is today. Evolution certainly fits into this kind of science. You know, the science that put a man on the moon cannot tell you how old a rock or a fossil actually is. Science, operational science, is based on repeatable, observable, present tense experiments, right? It's like boiling water in a pot. It boils at, in America at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. In Canada, it's 100 degrees Celsius. But you can do that over and over and over again. And you know what? It falls at exactly the same temperature every single time. It's something that you can do in the present tense. You can repeat it over and over, and you can observe the results every... That's operational science. But evolution supposedly occurred in the past, one time over a period of time, and we do not see it happening today. Evolution is not based on operational science. So let's ask this question. Is there really any operational scientific evidence that supports a worldwide flood about 4,500 years ago? Because I can tell you, geology is where the rubber meets the road. When it comes to the authority of the Bible, geology is where the rubber meets the road. Yes, even as creationists, we were not there in the past. We can only observe what is left behind. And then we have to see, does it fit the biblical model? Well, let's go to the Grand Canyon for a moment. Evolutionary geologists will tell you that the Grand Canyon is a testament to millions of years of slow and gradual processes. They'll tell you that the Colorado River carved that canyon over tens of millions of years. But they'll also tell you, you see these color strata bands, different colors? They'll tell you that those bands, which are made up of sedimentary rock, Historically, they have taught, and many still teach it today, that each of those fine layers, usually coarse fine, coarse fine, coarse fine, were laid down over thousands of years. In other words, many will say that each one represents one year of Earth history. Folks, that's where the idea of millions of years originated. Not from radioisotope dating. But you know what? That's an interpretation of the geologic record. They were not there to observe it. We were not there to observe it. But something happened in 1980 at Mount St. Helens. And we discovered as creationists, yes, sedimentary layers and multiple strata can be laid down very quickly and canyons can be formed in very short periods of time. At 8.32 a.m. on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted with 20 million tons of TNT blast energy blasting over four million cubic meters out of the top and side of that mountain. Basically, the top 1,300 feet of the mountain was blown away. It created a 550-degree pyroclastic cloud moving at over 200 miles an hour. Rocks as big as city blocks were thrown for six miles. By the way, that was a very small eruption, like one of the smallest by comparison to other eruptions that have been documented. But this is what was left after the explosion. And guess what? All that dirt, all that mud had to go somewhere. It laid down layers. In some cases, sedimentary layers. You can see the lady at the bottom for scale, but between the two red lines lies over 24 feet, almost 25 feet of sedimentation. Coarse fine, coarse fine, coarse fine like we find at the Grand Canyon. And here you can see the fine lines of sedimentation. Now, if an evolutionary geologist came along and saw this in any other location, they would naturally assume that each of those fine sedimentary layers represents one year of Earth history. But it doesn't. Guess what? 
all 24 feet of that sedimentation was laid down on June 12, 1980 in three hours. 24 plus feet of sedimentation laid down in three hours. And folks, we have so much evidence that all these rock layers, these sedimentary rock layers were laid down quickly. Now, obviously, this American dollar bill is millions of years old, buried in sandstone. Here's another fish, this time a flounder. And again, like we saw in Sunday school, you're not just looking at bones. You're looking at skin, flesh, scales, fins, all fossilized. So that represents not only rapid burial, but rapid fossilization. You know, what we're talking about here is called uniformitarian geology. It, and it's speaking of slow and gradual processes, that things were laid down very slowly, that these layers represent periods of time, usually one year of Earth history. And because of that uniformitarian thinking, Charles Darwin wrote this in his book on the origin of species in chapter 10. No organism wholly solved can be preserved. Now, if you believe in uniformitarianism, that makes sense. That was completely logical to Charles Darwin because if things are covered slowly and fossilized slowly over millions of years, something like a jellyfish could never be fossilized. Yet we have millions of fossilized jellyfish and squids and all kinds of soft organisms today. Here's a fossilized hat. This was a soft felt miner's hat buried in an explosion in 1880. The soft felt material has been replaced by minerals. It's petrification, a form of fossilization. It was uncovered in the year 1900. We could say it evolved into a hard hat in less than 20 years, couldn't we? And we saw the dinosaur soft tissue that's not fossilized, including blood vessels that are flexible and resilient, and when stretched, return to their original shape. But I didn't tell you something. I didn't tell you in January of 2013, last year, paleontologists documented dinosaur DNA still intact. Does anybody have any idea how quickly DNA breaks down? Folks, the things they're trying to come up with to explain this today with the iron and hemoglobin, for one, take a look at the experiments, it's ridiculous. But secondly, even if their experiments were legitimate, we're talking about it lasting two years compared to a few days without the iron in the hemoglobin. It doesn't explain 65 plus million years. And guess what? You may not realize this. Everybody thinks carbon-14 goes against creationists. Did you know that carbon-14 is creationist's best friend? There is carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. You know the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years? So every 5,730 years, you have half as much carbon-14. So after about 50 to 60, 64,000 max, you shouldn't even be able to measure any carbon-14 if things could last that long. We have carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. We have carbon-14 in diamonds that are supposed to be over 1 billion years old. A lot of carbon-14. And the lattice bonds in diamonds are so tight that even the evolutionists know that carbon-14 could never leach into the diamond. It's impossible. Carbon-14 is creationist's best friend, big time. There's so much evidence that these layers were laid down quickly. We don't even know what to do with all of it. We don't even know how to categorize all of it. But there's also evidence from Mount St. Helens that canyons were formed quickly. Here's the Little Grand Canyon. This canyon is 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. It was carved as a result of a secondary eruption at Mount St. Helens as well. I wonder how long it took that canyon to form through semi-hardened sedimentary rock. It took less than one day to cut a canyon, 1 40th the size of the Grand Canyon. Well, with that in mind, back to the Grand Canyon. Could we think of an event in history that could have provided the mechanism 
to lay down multiple layers of sedimentation that make up these strata and carve a canyon this huge in a short period of time. Can anybody think of an event like that from biblical history? The flood, exactly, it's so obvious. You know, because of the kind of... <laughs> Because of the kind of evidence I'm showing you this morning, it's almost funny to me the longer I'm in this. Evolutionists have come up with another place to put their millions of years. Back to the Grand Canyon again. Look at the rim of the canyon. All kinds of erosion. I don't know about you. I don't know if you remember last spring around Atlanta here. There was all kinds of erosion. You know there were places where sedimentary rock eroded? It happens fairly rapidly in the right conditions. There was a lot of rain last spring. But notice the coconut-owned sandstone in the Grand Canyon. This is a layer of strata, coconut-owned sandstone, 300, over 300, 302 feet thick at the Grand Canyon. Now this layer of strata, we're going to stop for a second here. This layer of strata extends some 250,000 square kilometers over much of the western United States. Now, I wonder what kind of an event could lay that down. Could a river do it? No. Could a delta do it? No. It would take something like a global flood to lay down layers of strata. And we have layers of strata on every continent, like actually some going from continent to continent. Well, at the Grand Canyon, the Coconino sandstone sits above the hermit shale. And now, because of what I've showed you today, Many evolutionists, ge evolutionary geologists will say, yes, the coconut on sandstone was laid down quickly. The hermit shell was laid down quickly. So guess where they put their millions of years? Between the layers of strata. There's supposedly 12 million years between those layers of strata. This probably won't surprise you. I have a problem with that. For one, there's hardly ever any erosion between any layers of strata. So they're telling me that the hermit shell sat there for 12 million years and never eroded? When we can watch hardened sedimentary rock erode today in, a, in the spring of a year? I have a hard time believing that. We even find places, and this is on top of the Coconino sandstone, where while the bottom layer of strata was still soft, animals left footprints, and before the next layer of strata was laid down, not even the footprints eroded away. We even find the impression of raindrops. Interesting. We find places where all the sediment, all the strata had to be soft at the same time. There couldn't, the bottom couldn't be millions of years old and the top one soft because when they were pushed up, they were all soft at the same time. And it's obvious. We find what's called polystrate fossils. These are fossils that exist through multiple layers of strata sometimes three and four layers of strata. So could a tree, this is a fossilized tree, could it sit in the bottom layer of strata for 12 million years waiting for the next layer to come along? Trees don't have, most trees only have a life expectancy of two to 300 years. There are exceptions. Why wouldn't we find these trees, do they usually not have any root systems? Did they grow without roots? When they do have root systems, sometimes the roots are on top. Did they grow upside down? I would suggest that they were transported, uprooted some, many broken off in a catastrophic event called the global flood and buried in multiple layers of sedimentation. That's exactly what we would expect to find if we begin with the Bible as true. They have no place left to put their millions of years, do they? See, the problem is not the evidence. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Peter told us the problem that we're talking about this morning. 2 Peter chapter 3. In the last days, mockers will come walking after their own lust. There's the problem. They'll say three things. They will scoff or mock at the second coming of Christ. They will say all things continue as it was from the beginning. That's uniformitarianism. And they will deny the blood. There's the problem. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the evidence. It's the heart of man. Now please understand, I know that there's a lot of people that just follow what people tell them. They're taught something and they respect their professor and they just believe it. But ultimately that's what's behind it. 
That's what generates or motivates all of this evolutionary, uniformitarian thinking. What does the Bible really teach? The Bible teaches that about 6,000 years ago, in six literal days, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything was created in six literal days about 6,000 years ago. And the giving of the Ten Commandments, what does it say? Exodus chapter 20. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy in six days. Now, this is a phrase in the Hebrew that describes all of creation without a doubt. So God creating in six days, looking back. The Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 11. Now notice... The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You know our work week is based on the creation week. It's not based on anything solar. It's not based on anything lunar. It's based on the creation. Now, you might not have known, noticed this, but we don't work for six million years and get a million years off, do we? We work for one, some of us, <laughs> sometimes work for six days and then we get a day off because it's based on the creation week. The Bible also teaches that everything was created to reproduce after its kind. Folks, I know natural selection occurs. I know that genetic mutations occur. It's a part of God's creative order, especially natural selection. Genetic mutations came about as the curse, we believe. But neither mechanism ever increases the kind of new information required for the evolutionary process. Never. There's not one single example. So we do find dogs always being dogs, people always being people, cats are always cats, horses are always horses. There's variation, there's speciation, yes. But they're always in the same kind, and there are no transitional forms between animal kinds. But we're not animals. We were created in the very image of God. The Bible is perfectly clear. And Jesus Christ himself, King of kings and Lord of lords, made this statement concerning the creation of the man. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. When did God make them? From the beginning of the creation. Now, if you accept the biblical timeline of about 4,000 years before Christ, day 6, you can't even differentiate between day one we are talking about the beginning of the creation that makes sense in light of what Christ says but if you accept the 13 to 14.3 billion years of earth history the evolutionary idea where does that put man coming on the scene almost at the end was Jesus wrong He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the eyewitness. He's the creator. He knows when man was made. And his word is trustworthy. You see, a lot of people don't realize this. But this is a very, very powerful analogy. When God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden. And he declared at the end of day six, everything to be very good. But if you put man's years into Genesis, I don't care which theory you use, day age, gap theory, the hard gap, the soft gap, progressive creationism, framework hypothesis, it doesn't matter how you do it. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying that that geologic column was laid down prior to Adam and Eve and that Adam and Eve were standing on millions of dead creatures, fossilized. Would God call that very good? You think God used the process of struggle and death and suffering and disease to bring about creation and then declare it very good? You know what that means? That means death before sin. Because according to Romans 5 and Romans chapter 8, what caused even death in this? What causes creation 
to groan and suffer even to this day. It was the sin of man. That would mean death before sin, wouldn't it? To an evolutionist, death is the victor in a way. I mean, you have to believe that death is a good thing in one sense to believe in evolution. See, the less fit, the weaker have to die off before they pass on the genetic information or this evolutionary process can't proceed. So in a sense, in the evolutionary theory, death is the hero. The weaker and the less fit have to die off. But according to the Bible, sin brought death. The wages of sin is death. You know, it wasn't long before Cain murdered his brother Abel. And we see the wages of sin is death. We see sin affecting the human race. Within 1,500 years, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God goes on to describe the flood that was coming. God was sending judgment to this world. But the next verse, or a couple of verses later, verse 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm glad Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God gave Noah detailed instructions for the building of an ark. Noah believed God, and he did exactly what God told him to do. And that ark that Noah built was a place of safety. It was a place of safety from the judgment of God that God was going to pour out on this earth. Folks, the ark and the flood were not fairy tales as we saw in Sunday school. We're talking about a serious event. And that vessel that you've seen here was a huge vessel. You can see the proportions here. It wasn't some bathtub type uh, boat that we see portrayed today. It was a huge vessel with a carrying capacity of 522 railroad stock cars. And there were seven pairs of each clean animal that God sent, two, uh, two of each unclean, male and female. Uh, un unclean. And almost all animals, by the way, are unclean animals. You know, we're only talking about somewhere around 8,000 animal kinds. So we're not talking about much more than 16,000 animals being put on the ark. If you have to take into account, even if they had to store water, they stored water, they certainly had to store food, they had to have bedding for a year, they had to store waste, maybe. And the animals had to have some degree of room for exercise in their cages. You know, if you take all that into account with 16,000 animals, taking into account the average size of an animal, which is actually, on average, for young animals, which they would have been having to reproduce, they would have not been much larger, on average, than a large rat. You know, we're talking about using up less than half of the yard for the animals and for all the requirements to take care of those animals? There's plenty enough room to put all the creatures on the yard. So what we're talking about is God knew what he was doing. God provided a place of safety because what was about to happen was a catastrophic event. You know what's described? The first thing that happened, the fountains of the great deep broke open. And we believe that we're talking about what's called catastrophic plate tectonics. We're talking about continents moving at meters per second. We're talking about rapid subduction. The, the, former, uh, the former plate of the ocean subducting under the continents in many cases into the mantle of the earth. You know, we can, seismologists look down today and they can still see those mantles, or not the mantle, they can still see those plates that subducted into the mantle of the earth. Now, evolutionists believe that it happened. They just think it happened over millions of years. But guess what? The temperature of those plates are still cooler than the surrounding mantle. And that could not be true if we're talking about millions of years. So why am I pointing this out? Because we're talking about a catastrophic event. We're talking about an event that was the judgment of God upon sinful creatures on man. And that ark, yes, would have been stable. Regardless of what Bill Nye says, the ark would have been stable in 400 kilometer winds and waves 
well over 400, 250 mile an hour winds and waves well over 100 feet high, no problem. Dr. Warner Gitt, one of our scientists and head information, the head of information and science in Germany, uh, put, and by the way, it's not just Gitt that's done this, but many engineers and scientists around the world have used computer models to try to determine what would be the best shaped ship and what would be the right size ship that could withstand the greatest forces. And guess what comes out every time? The exact dimensions of the ark and the proportions of the ark. And keep in mind, before the flood, we did not have mountains like Mount Everest. That is something that's described as occurring or taking place somewhere around day 150 during the flood. But the Bible does say the waters prevailed, prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole earth were covered. All those high hills that we had prior to the flood were covered. And by the way, if you, take a, if you lower the mountains today and raise up the oceans, you have the earth covered with almost two miles of water in every single place. But in Psalm 104, it says in verse 8, the mountains rose and the valley sank down to the place which you established for them. Now we believe when you get to verse 8 in this context that you're actually talking about the flood here. Because verse 9 says that God set a boundary where the waters would never again pass over. So by the time you get into verse 8, it's not talking about creation, it's talking about the flood. And we find this kind of phenomenon in the Hebrew language very often. It's a common occurrence. So we have not only in the early parts of the flood, all this sedimentation being laid down. This was a catastrophic event. We have continents moving. We have the, the ocean plate subducting, subducting into the mantle of the earth. And then we have mountains rising and the valley sinking down to the new ocean floors and the water rushing off. Now, with what I've just shared, you know what happens? Sometimes Christians don't put two and two together. And they will ask us, well, what happened to all the water? Whoops. I hit the wrong button. I apologize for that. What happened to all the water? Even with what the and even when we explain what the Bible says, what happened to all the water? Let me ask you this: What happened to all the water? Seventy-two percent of the Earth is covered with water today. Now, scientists don't believe. Most scientists don't believe that there's ever been a global flood on the Earth. But they believe there was a global flood on Mars, and they're still debating whether there's traces of water there. That's interesting to me. So yes, we're talking about a catastrophic event because the wages of sin is death. Well, this is what this is all about. Why don't people believe in biblical geology? It's got nothing to do with the evidence. It's got everything to do with the heart. People don't want to believe that they're going to be accountable to a God that can righteously and justly judge as God did in the global flood. The wages of sin is death. Folks, God always keeps His word. He's a faithful God. And when He pronounces judgment, He promises judgment, He always brings it about. But we can rest assured that God is a gracious God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, God provided a place of safety for Adam. That place of safety had one door. The Bible says God shut the door. I don't believe there's any power on earth that could have opened that door until it was the right time. Because God shut the door. Folks, those people were safe. Noah and his family, the eight souls, were safe inside that ark. Total safety from the rage going on around them. The catastrophe that took place on this earth. But I want you to notice that ark had one door. There was only one door through which to enter that place of safety and be saved. 
There's a similar similar analogy given in John chapter 10. Jesus speaking in a sheepfold where he said, I am the door. If any man enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Folks, there's a place of safety today from the judgment of God. Judgment of God will come upon this earth. And I look around me today and I see what's happening to our country. It, it breaks me. But I know where we're heading. God has provided promise, not wa- not judgment by water, but judgment by fire. And so we call every man today to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of God, turn from your sin and turn to Christ. He's the only door through which you can be saved and find pasture. He's the only way to enter that place of safety where you're free from the judgment of God, the judgment of God that, yes, you and I both deserve. Folks, I realize what I deserve. I deserve the judgment of a holy God. I'm a sinner. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm glad Noah found grace. Folks, the only reason I'm not facing the judgment of God and you're not facing it, if if you're not, it's because of Jesus Christ. Because He is the door. If you don't know the Lord this morning, I challenge you. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. Nobody ever has. Nobody ever will. If you know the Lord, folks, this is a serious issue because we're talking about the very foundation for the gospel that we supposedly love and proclaim. We are to make a defense. We are to defend. And you know, Mike Adams, Dr. Mike Adams said this, if Christianity dies in America, it will not be for a lack of the evidence of its truthfulness. It will be for a lack of dissemination of the truth for its evidence. Folks, we need to get our hands on things that will help us, and that's what I'm here to challenge you to do.